Let us pray. O oh God, your word has been read and is about to be proclaimed. We ask now that you would open our hearts and minds by the power and inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we might hear a word from you today. Amen. Last week, we started a new sermon series entitled Be the Light, and we're considering how in a world that is so polarized and angry, we might behave differently. Last week, we also considered why is it so hard to love people, and we talked about sin, this inward curving where we put an emphasis on our wants, desires, fears, and needs, and how this plays itself out in individual relationships, but also systemically and structurally. And today is part two of why is it so hard to love people? And it's because we are all wounded, folks. We come into an imperfect world. We have imperfect relationships. We have experiences that scar us. It's just a part of life. No matter how much our caregivers love us growing up, they are imperfect and their wounding is inescapable. Now, I know that doesn't sound like really good news, but there is good news that we are going to get to. Trust me on that. But studies show that one out of seven children who grow up in the U.S. experience neglect, two-thirds children in the U.S. experience some sort of adverse experience before they are 16. And again, all of us, whether or not we experience something that significant, are indeed wounded. Rich Viotis, whom I referenced last week, said we might think of it in terms as we are growing up that we all get things that we didn't deserve, all have things that we didn't deserve happen to us, and we don't get things that we did deserve. And so when we enter into a conversation or relationship with someone, we have a lot of baggage that we are carrying with us that may not be readily apparent, and it can have a negative impact on relationships if we don't take the time to pause and to recognize what's going on. On Tuesday, I was in Nashville at a clergy gathering, and I was talking with a friend that wasn't looking for a sermon illustration, but it just happened. I don't know how the conversation started, but this friend of mine is really smart. He graduated Phi Beta Kappa from University of Kentucky. We might question, no, some of you are Kentucky friend, uh, fans. But he's dyslexic. And so that says to me again just how smart he is that he was able to pull that off with the help of a mother who worked with him. Now he asked me not to share his name, so I'm going to try not to, but it might slip out. But what he said was, as he was growing up with dyslexia, he's some years older than I am, that wasn't a recognized uh, illness pattern in those days. And he had a teacher who made fun of him in every class and would call out and say things like, Mr. I'm going to try to call him Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, a grill cannot walk down the street, grill being G-R-I-L instead of G-R, G-I-R, anyway, grill instead of girl. You're following with me because you know what dyslexia is. And so he got married, had children who are academically gifted, doing really well in school, but every time he went to meet with their teachers, he was just full of anxiety. And finally, one of the teachers looked at him and said, sir, your children's experiences are not your experiences. Relax. And he said it was transformational to hear that. He wasn't aware of what he was bringing into every single meeting, but he remembered being ridiculed by teachers, being ridiculed by his peers, and he had that fear for his children that was unnecessary and misplaced. Pastor Bo referenced briefly 
the conflict that's going on between Saul and David in the passage that he read, but let's refresh our memories, if you will, that Saul is named king of Israel. Now, he doesn't really want to be named king initially. He's hiding in the baggage and the supplies when they are ready to name him king, but he is named king. He experiences some success, but the Philistines are waging war against the Israelites, and they have a giant called Goliath that everyone is terrified of who has come out and has offered single combat. Nobody is willing to stand up to him until David, who has come to bring supplies to his older brothers, says, I'll take care of this. And he gets a slingshot. Saul tries to put him in his armor. He says, I can't wear that. It weighs him down. Takes a slingshot and slays Goliath. It's one of those great stories that we grow up knowing that when we have God on our side, we can face giants. But As happy as Saul was initially, he gave David his daughter in marriage. Saul becomes very jealous and insecure of David because the people will chant, Saul has killed his thousands and David has killed tens of thousands. And after a while, this sort of gets on Saul's nerves. Scripture says he's troubled in spirit, and the only thing that can soothe him is David playing a musical instrument, a reminder of what a gift you all are to us. But at one point, Saul wants to throw a spear at him, and David decides to run off. His life is in danger, and Saul um, goes so far at one point to take the wife his daughter that he'd given David and give her to another man in marriage. I mean, the relationship has deteriorated at this point, folks. So in the passage that Pastor Bo read, Saul is out with 3,000 people looking for David to kill him, and David is running around with 600. And in this moment... Saul comes into a cave, and David and his men are there, and David has the opportunity to kill Saul. And his men are egging him on. Look, God's delivering men to your hands. You're going to be king. It's okay. Go for it. And he says, no, this man is God's anointed, and I can't do it. Instead, he creeps up to him and cuts off a part of his robe and then shouts to Saul and says, look, I could have killed you, and I chose not to. And Scripture tells us that Saul has, in that moment anyway, a change of heart and weeps and realizes that David has taken the better path. But all of that history had influenced the decisions up until that point. And it's David's relationship with God that provided healing that allowed him to take a different path. So what I want to consider today, the invitation's coming early, but I'm not through with the sermon. The invitation is to ask God to help us identify what our triggers are, what our hurts, habits, and hang-ups are, so we can choose a different way of relating than creating further harm in a relationship. What a different world it would be if we were able to live in such a manner. In Emotionally Healthy Discipleship, Peter and Jerry Scazzaro write, it is possible to be a Christian for 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years and still fight still handle conflict as if we were in our family of origin because those patterns are so deeply ingrained. Whatever we witnessed, however we saw conflict handled, we continue in our own lives unless God heals us and we make a conscious decision not to continue that. This is often described as the difference between dirty fighting and clean fighting. You know, dirty fighting is when, I don't know, 
Um, you give someone the silent treatment. Maybe you're passive aggressive. Maybe you shout. Maybe you yell. You give in to anger, rage. You are condescending. You are critical. You know what I'm talking about. Dirty fighting. Clean fighting is when we say that we value the other person so much. We see the other person as a child of God, and we're going to ask the Spirit of God to overcome our generational ways of relating. Clean fighting, yes, this is the exact quote that I wanted from the Cazeros, is about breaking negative generational patterns through the Spirit of God. The truth is, friends, our ability to handle conflict well is a sign of how mature we are in Christ, how much we have allowed Christ to shape us and to change us. Now, at this point, there's a part of me that's like, you just need to walk out that door and quit preaching, Harriet, because you get this wrong a lot more than people know that you do. And that's where repentance and asking for forgiveness and trying again comes in. So don't hear me say that I'm taking the high moral ground. I'm saying this is something that we are all striving for towards and together. Now, here comes the meteor part of the sermon. And I have notes because I knew I wasn't going to remember all of this. But I was led to a book that another friend recommended to me. It's great when things just sort of come together when you're working on a sermon, called Fight Right by John and Julie Gottman. They've done a lot of work um, primarily on relationships between couples, but these practices apply outside of a romantic relationship. I think they apply regardless. And they identify three common ways that conflict gets stalled or escalates in unhealthy patterns. And they are the harsh startup, flooding, and standoff. So we're going to run through those, what they look like, and then how you might counter them and see if you recognize this in your own life, if you recognize it um, maybe in Washington, other places. But anyway, um, a harsh startup is an attack where we immediately start telling the other person what they are doing wrong. And maybe we've been bottling things up, and so we throw the whole kitchen sink at them. I mean, we just let them have it. A harsh startup begins with a baseline assumption of everything I'm doing makes sense, and everything you all are doing is wrong, just so you know. Um, of course, that's not a way to have a constructive conversation. Are they going to want to talk to me if I point out to them? No, see, they're shaking their heads. Absolutely not. Um, Tim, you're going to have to help me do some repair work after the service. But criticism is always destructive, and it takes the form of attacking another person's core or their character. The difference between criticism and a complaint is a complaint is focused on a specific action or behavior that we want to have changed. And criticism just cuts somebody off at the knees and immediately makes them defensive. So, what does a soft startup look like? I know you're wondering, and I have the answer for you. Complain, but don't blame. And secondly, this is where it's so important to use I statements instead of you statements. Listen to the difference in these comments. You are not listening to me, we can say, and I don't feel heard right now. See, that's keeping the focus on what we are experiencing instead of automatically blaming the other person. Now, as tempting as it might be to make an I statement that sounds like, I feel like you never listen to me, that defeats the purpose. The I statement is describing what we are experiencing, what we are feeling, and provides an opportunity for feedback and connection. And so, we are describing what's happening and not judging the other person. 
And it's really important here, if possible, not to store things up and just hammer people with everything they've done wrong or everything with which you disagree. Pick one something and focus on that. Now, when we are in conflict, we can also experience what is called flooding, where psychologically and emotionally and physically, we are responding in a very forceful manner to what is going on with the other person. You might say that we are feeling overwhelmed. You know, your heart starts racing, your palms are sweaty, you instantly enter fight or flight mode, and this also breaks down the possibility of working towards a solution. And the Gottmans say the answer here is to take a break, to pause. Might be 20 minutes, might be 24 hours, but agree, say, hey, I, I need to step away from this, and then agree upon when you'll come back and come back and continue the conversation. Now the challenge here is when you take that break, when we take that break, that's not a time for us to rehearse our arguments and think of everything we're gonna say. It is not a time to feel like the victim. It's time to listen to a podcast, go for a walk. Don't think about the fight. Do something that regulates our emotions until we are calm in body, mind, and spirit, and are able to come back and to continue the conversation. But that seems so often um, more difficult, and it's not something that we see modeled really well. Now, a standoff is when both sides are determined that I am going to win. I have to win. I must win. In our minds, we are logical, neutral, and correct. Others just need to see the light. Why would we compromise when their position is clearly so incorrect or impossible? Ever had that thought? Um, don't look at your partner if you're here with a partner right now. But if standoff lasts long enough, it becomes gridlock and we become completely shut down to one another. There's no listening to each other, there's no opening up, there's no collaborating, and there's no understanding, and we become worn down. An insight that really struck me, I have this underlined in italics and highlighted, friends, is almost all gridlocked conflict is actually about unfulfilled dreams. Almost all gridlocked conflict is actually about unfulfilled dreams. We have a dream for connection. We have a dream for being seen, being heard. We have some sort of dream that is not being realized. And if we can get to the root of that, then healing can occur. So the solution here is to take a deep breath and to ask ourselves some questions. Now, if we're really mad, we might have to take more than one breath because the first question that I have for us is, do I think this person has basic common sense? The next question is, do I want this person to feel respected or not? Sort of the golden rule. We want to be respected. Do we want the other person to be res respected? Am I interested? Can I be interested in the other person's position or opinion? And am I capable of being curious? We're going to delve into curiosity in another sermon, but it is such a key um, trait to be cultivated to help diffuse our emotions if we can cultivate curiosity. So the Gottmans here give the advice, what they call a bagel, and if you like bagels, that works. I prefer to think of a donut. Um, but where in the center, you write down what you absolutely cannot compromise on. And outside, you write where you could compromise. And more often than not, 
once you identify what those non-negotiables are, you see that there aren't as many as there are areas where compromise and flexibility are possible, and that then gives us a springboard to have a conversation. I can't negotiate on this, but here maybe, and then we can understand what makes the other person tick. The key here is to be able to ask each other why the things in the inner circle are so important to you. Why is this a non-negotiable? And then to actually listen and to receive it. The Gottmans point out that the more we allow ourselves to be influenced by someone else, then the more capacity we will have to influence them. And if we can't be moved or budged at all, we will be perceived as an obstacle and they'll just move right on around us. And it is impossible then to influence. Now, hear me say that accepting influence does not mean simply collapsing into the other person's perspective and agreeing with everything that they think. It means being willing to learn more about how they feel and why they feel that way. Again, it's a basic need for us to be seen and heard and valued. And when we see another person, when we hear another person, it communicates that we value them. David Augsburger once said that listening is so close to being loved that most of us can't tell the difference. So that is just, those are some tips for when we get triggered of how we might respond. Brooke already did a superb job with the gospel today, but I deliberately paired the gospel with the story of Saul and David because I want us to be reminded that this is ongoing work, that as much as we might want to be healed instantly, that rarely happens when we're carrying all that baggage behind us, as that first therapist told me. These are your issues, and you're going to have to learn to deal with them. But the hope is that we really are able to recognize them. The hope is that we ask God to work in us to help us see where our blind spots are, to enable us to be more patient, to have that fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, and that we are able to learn new patterns of acting and relating like David did. A friend of mine preached on this topic last week, and she posted this on her Facebook page. Unresolved trauma leaves a door open for uninvited drama. And I told her, her name's Cheryl Moore. I said, I'm going to give you credit, but I'm going to quote you because I thought it was so powerful. Unresolved trauma leaves a door open for uninvited drama. Now let's go back to the story that we heard in 1 Samuel and note that David's bitterness and anger had not been stored up. He'd been writing the Psalms, he'd been pouring his heart out to God, and because he didn't hold on to his anger and bitterness, he was able to resist the temptation to annihilate Saul. If he had been holding on to all of that in his heart, then he probably would not have been able to resist that temptation. Also note, that David went out of the cave. He valued the relationship with Saul enough to be willing to confront and to continue the conversation. Been easier, perhaps, for him to just avoid it and stay hidden, but he did not choose the easy path. And lastly, as I already pointed out, Saul's heart was changed as a result of David's different behavior. And that is the hope, friends, that as we change how we relate and interact with others, then their response changes. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we want to assert ourselves in holy and blameless ways, 
And so we ask you to search us and to show us what our hurts, habits, and hang-ups are, how and where and when we are prone to engage in dirty fighting. Make us pure of heart and lead us as we negotiate differences so that we might be your witnesses in our relationships with others. Amen. <laughs>